front part of your hymn book. O Lord, open thou my lips. St. 
Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 13. He was delivered, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel appointed for the last Sunday of the church year comes from Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 27. There followed Jesus a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wounds that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals uh, who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word, this is the gospel of our Lord. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. but since we have all the kids singing in the second service, I don't sense any of the little ones here in this service. So we will continue with our sermon.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A text for our message this morning is our epistle lesson, Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 20. Here, rereading these words. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is our text. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, no doubt you notice how it is getting darker early nowadays. The darkness has been growing for weeks as the days get shorter and as daylight savings time is now a distant memory. In ancient times, pagan people thought the darkness signaled the triumph of evil gods or some king of the underworld over the gods of the light. Of course, we know it's just part of nature's cycle. We're used to more darkness in our lives this time of year. But even though we are used to it, we know as well that darkness has a certain power, doesn't it? And it's not necessarily power for good. If you get lost in physical darkness, you are certainly much more vulnerable. You can't see danger coming in advance. If you've ever tried to walk through a dark room, you trip over something, you know it is dangerous. Just as a human necessity, we need light. In those parts of the world where it's dark for long stretches of the year, people have to take steps to fight off depression or other afflictions of the spirit. Physical darkness has a certain power. Spiritual darkness has power too. In our lives and in our world, spiritual darkness can seem very powerful at times, almost as if it controls and rules over us. We know there really is a king of darkness, and he is powerful. But even though we feel the power of darkness, God's word to the Colossians holds out for us a tremendous promise. That as we come to the conclusion of another church year, we remember the king on this Christ the King Sunday, the King of Light, Jesus Christ, that he reigns now and the authority of darkness has been broken. Deliverance from darkness is so vitally important because the darkness seems so strong. Satan's domain is described as the domain of darkness. The reason why this is such an apt description is because the devil trades in deception and temptation <clears throat> and fear. There's reason for this. If you think about it, what Satan is trying to do to us is so evil and vile and destructive that it would look hideous to everyone in the light. So he keeps his intentions cloaked in darkness. He would never come right out and admit that he's trying to destroy people physically, emotionally, or spiritually. No. He's always hiding in the darkness. He's always lurking in the shadows. And what we can't see either traps us if we're unsuspecting or leads us to despair if we know something is there but we don't know how to fight it. We are for once in the domain of darkness spiritually because sin cast us out of the kingdom of light. And even now, Satan still has his pull on you and me. We get pulled in with deception. We are tempted with sinful pleasures, like immorality, gambling, drunkenness, gossip, all under the guise of just, you know, living a little. The devil assures us that he would never lead us to something dangerous. He just wants us to have a little fun our lives. It makes us feel like there's a big party going on somewhere out there and we've been left out and so we stumble. We give in to sinful behavior. 
maybe at first we feel guilty, but part of us also feels excited. It isn't until later that we realize how destructive such behavior is to our health, our relationships, and our faith. Or Satan pulls us in with temptation. And if we should question where he is leading us, he makes us think that it isn't really wrong. It isn't wrong to make a little money on the side, everyone else is doing it, or, or to cheat people just a little. Let the buyer beware. Why should the government have to know? Is it wrong to just flirt with other people? What your spouse doesn't know isn't going to hurt them. Is it wrong to miss church every now and then? It isn't like you're an unbeliever yet. And if deception and temptation won't work, Satan will try to pull us in with fear. If he can't get us to do bad things, he can try to make us think that we ourselves are bad. He can pinpoint Every sin in your life, every bad thought, every hurtful word, every missed opportunity to do the right thing. This leaves us feeling, I am so sinful. How could God possibly forgive someone like me? Therefore, whenever something bad happens in my life, a bad exam from the doctors, a financial setback, my kid getting into trouble at school. See? See, God is giving you back for what an awful person you are. That pull of sin and Satan may deceive you and tempt you into evil or it may lead you into discouragement and despair. Either way, the devil is able to pull you away from God. Evil and fear are probably the most commonly driven highways in our world today. And both of them lead a person far away from God, from his love, his salvation, and his wonderful plan for our lives. Once Satan pulls us away far enough, he holds up a mirror and says, look at yourself. What's wrong with you? Maybe you should just give up the battle and stop trying to live for Christ. And so many people fall away. Sometimes little by little, sometimes quickly and dramatically. But they fall away nonetheless and end up in darkness. But dear friends, God has rescued you and me from the darkness and has placed us under the authority of his Son. St. Paul says, he begins our text today, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God delivered you from the authority of darkness. That means that darkness does not have to have a pull on you anymore. Sin's allure and influence does not have to control you or your decisions. Sin's guilt and condemnation does not have to make you afraid. God transferred you to the reign of his Son. You live in Christ's kingdom now. He is your king, the Lord of your life. He is the one on the throne of your heart, not the devil, not the world, not even your own sinful, selfish desires. Jesus rules now. It is significant the way Paul expressed this gospel truth in verse 13 of our epistle lesson. He's not talking about some future expectation or potentiality. He's talking about something that has already occurred in the past and thus affects how we can look at our lives in the present. He has delivered us. He has transferred us. God rescued you. It has already happened. Believe it. Celebrate it. And most importantly, live in it. This all happened through one singular event. The most important event in all of human history, the event covered in today's gospel lesson, the cross. We have redemption because of the death of God's own beloved son. Christ's death on the cross paid for all our sins. It bought us back from darkness. Those sins we've toyed with because we thought there was a party going on that we were missing out on, 
all the money wasted on worldly pleasure or greedy ambition, all the time misspent on lustful, destructive behavior, and all the mistakes that have hurt ourselves and others, all those sins were forgiven at the cross. Those sins we tried to rationalize away, the lying, the cheating, the unfaithfulness to those we love, and especially to God, all those sins were forgiven at the cross. Even those sins we knew, where we knew where we were wrong, and knew we were deadly, yet did anyway. The sins that are tormenting us with guilt, choices we've made, opportunities we've ignored, yes, all of these too were forgiven at the cross. The price was high, don't get me wrong, but God was willing to pay it. The blood of Christ covered the cost. The rescue was complete. Jesus Christ, God's Son, rules. He has the authority to break the power of darkness now and forever. The Son has the same nature as the Father. Or as Paul puts it, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. God reveals Himself openly through the person of the Son. He doesn't wish to keep us in the dark about His identity or His actions. What that means is that every time we see Jesus, we see our triune God. Every time we hear Jesus, we hear our triune God. Every time we experience the love of Christ, we know just how much God himself loves us. And in Christ, we see that God's actions are always gracious, forgiving, and loving. So how is it that the Son has the authority to rule? The Son made all things. His ability to rule has no limit. Paul writes, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Wow. Jesus shows that he, not Satan, is the powerful, rightful king of the universe. And when he returns, we will see his throne established and the evil pretender cast down once and for all. But not only did God the Son make all things, he also sustains all things. This is how vast his power is. Or as Paul puts it, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. His power is far-reaching. It reaches to every corner where Satan may lurk, setting his traps for the unsuspecting. How wonderful to know that Jesus not only sustains the universe, but he also sustains each and every individual. He sustains you. He sustains me. We really do not have anything to fear. Certainly not Satan's worst in this life, nor hell in eternity. And finally, Paul points out that our new king is the church's head. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He's the first one to do so, but he won't be the last. Our king's return in glory is the day on which we too will rise to life eternal. Christ did what he did by the fullness of God himself because he is God. Even when you and I don't feel particularly peaceful inside of ourselves. Jesus established peace between us and the Father by taking away all of the hatred and the evil of our sins in his body on the cross. He did it to reconcile to himself all things, making peace by the blood of his cross. Are you one of those people who needs the room completely dark when you sleep? I've heard that more and more people have been using those soft, cushioned sleeping masks, especially if they have to sleep during the day or when the, they live at a place where a lot of light at night filters through their bedroom windows. I can't imagine how such a mask would be comfortable, but those who wear them regularly swear by them. A really good one completely blocks out every single bit of light, which is good, 
for when you're sleep, trying to sleep, especially if you work the night shift and have to sleep during the day. But what would you think of someone who tried to live life with a mask like that over his or her eyes all the time? There's no telling how much damage people like that might do to themselves or to those around them. Well, when we focus on our sins, on our weaknesses, on what seems like the great power of darkness around <coughs> and in us, we can become like a person who wears a sleeping mask during the day. We stumble. We become paralyzed. We can't move anywhere safely. What a person like that needs to do is take off the mask, walk in the light. The good news of our salvation in Jesus Christ is like the act of taking off the mask and seeing things in the light for the very first time. As Paul assures us, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness. When you feel the pull and the power of darkness, and every, every Christian feels it, hold fast to God's promise. We are no longer under that condemnation, that danger, that fear. God has rescued us and transferred us to the reign of his Son. One day that rain will come in glory. Until then, we hold fast to our faith and we live in the light, rejoicing in our King. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, our worship continues with the gathering of our offering. You may be seated.
forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Church 
year. That means next Sunday, it's the first Sunday of Advent, the whole new church year, new season. We'll have our Advent devotion book with us. We have our giving tree up in the back. If you'd like to uh, help out with that, just take a tag and fill it. It's, uh, it's up a little early, maybe earlier than we have in years past, but that's not our decision. That's the decision of the people who run the program. We want to get everything done a little bit earlier. This week, of course, is Thanksgiving. You can choose between Thanksgiving Day at 9 o'clock uh, or Thanksgiving Eve at 7 o'clock. Please note something that's not in the calendar of the week. We had to move our uh, Board of Elders, Board of Trustees, uh, Church Council from Thursday. Didn't think anybody would come on Thanksgiving. Yes, for some reason. Uh, too much turkey on that. Uh, we moved it to Tuesday but it's not on the calendar of the week. So that means trustees and elders, 7 o'clock Tuesday, council meeting at 8 o'clock Tuesday night. So otherwise, just, I can tell you, in the next few weeks, lots of different things popping up, new events, different news, so keep yourself informed. May the Lord watch over you and bless you. May your life never have any pockets of darkness, but you always live in the light.